just spent some time with the YPs and uh, it was quite enjoyable. Now they have a, a bit of work to do for me and thinking about the organization. And now I want to um, talk about young professionals in the energy industry. I've, I've uh, done a talk similar to this before. This is my hometown of Calgary, um, up near our zoo and looking down west towards the mountains. It's a vibrant city. It's a big city about the size of Bukuramanga, um, about a million people. Uh, and it's home to the oil and gas industry in Canada. There are about 10,000 geoscientists who live in Calgary. So I'd like to thank a few people about this, for this presentation. Some of the YPs that are in Calgary encouraged me to do a talk like this a couple years ago. I had arranged nothing, so I've, I've grown the talk since then, but the YPs really were the ones who got me kicked off on this. A former past president of AAPG who I used some of his slides on ethics and professionalism. And of course, all the people that I've worked with through my career who have helped me and uh, made me a better person and a better geologist. So the presentation is pretty simple. I'm going to talk about generations. We're all part of a generation. I'm part of a very different generation than you are. And when I started work, there was another generation that I used to work with that is no longer in the industry. So I'm going to talk about generations and some general things about them that um, not for everybody, but most of, most of them apply to those generations. I'm going to talk particularly about you, your group. We, you're called the Millennials. And I'm going to talk about you guys a little bit more in detail so that you see how we, my generation, I'm a baby boomer, would perceive the millennials. I'm going to talk about how to enhance your career, aspects of being a professional geoscientist as well. So, who knows what this is? Okay, this is a game called Pong, P-O-N-G. So when I was young, this was a computer game these moved up and down, and this ball moved back and forth. So on Friday nights, we would play this for hours. So, so this is what video games were when I was young. Very different than video games today. So Pong was what I started when I started playing video games when I was a teenager. So I'm going to talk about the generations. I'm going to talk about four generations. Very just quickly high level, who are they? The first generation, which in North America we call the silent generation. Um, a lot of them are passed on by now. Uh, they were born between 1925 and 1945. The next generation I'm going to talk to you a little bit about are the baby boomers, which I was born in. One of the large, it was the largest generation until the millennials. In North America, uh, the, boomy, the boomers were, um, there were two, I'm, I'm in the second part of this, but there was roughly, you know, six million people in each part of that generation in North America. The Gen Xers, the people who were born between 1965 and 1980. You guys, the millennials, who were born roughly between 1981 and 2000. No, maybe it varies a year here or there. And it's funny because I started working in 1981. So the older millennials are, are at least 30 plus years old. And then a generation that's just being born today, I'm not going to talk about them because we don't know anything about them, other than the fact that they've never known life without an Apple product. So I just call them the I generation. And they are going to be the guys who you have to work with when you're leading the APG and you're leading your own gas companies. So these people will be different than you. They will be strange to you, but you still have to work with them someday. Okay, just to give you that in a different demographic, at age two, 2015, roughly age zero to age 75, you can see men and women, the largest bump in the millennial generation, North America, 83 million people. The boomers, smaller because, of course, we, now they're between 51 and 69, and some of them have died, so they're kind of getting smaller. And then, of course, the silent generation, virtually all of them are gone. And within another decade, they will be gone. Next. Oh, I think I can next. So let's talk about the silent generation, because they're the people, when I came into the industry, that I worked for. So they grew up in the Great Depression, and they grew up in World War II. Many of them fought in World War II as teenagers. Can you imagine going to Germany or going to Japan at 17, 18, 19 years old and fighting for your country? And then when the wars were won, they all came back to their countries, and that produced my generation, the baby boomers. So in that day, the men worked, 
and the women stayed at home and reared the families because you could live on one income. They wanted to be very financially secure, and, and I, bad English word maybe, but they were grounded in their corporations, meaning they started in one corporation, and 35 or 40 years later, they ended in the same corporation. They, they'd spent their whole time in one corporation. And for them, the work ethic was, they were, they were timeless, they always kept their heads down, they were productive, and they listened to their boss. They would never question their boss. That was the way they were. Along came my generation, who had to work for those people. So I grew up during the Cold War, and not meaning cold that I was in Canada. People know what the Cold War is when Russia and the United States were very unhappy with each other. The birth of rock and roll, I can still remember uh, the first Beatle albums. I can remember man landing on the moon. It did happen. I saw it on TV. Um, we were the largest generation, and we were hierarchical, meaning that we always tried to win. And the difference was, when we played sports, somebody won and somebody <coughs> lost. Today, everybody's a good participant. Okay? Um, and we played hard at work and life, and for the most part, the generation was very success successful. We used to work very long hours, and some of us still do. Many people like me have adjusted my lifestyle. Very few holidays. We had two weeks holidays a year when I started working in it. And our work ethic was that we were work-centric, so everything that we did was related to working. We were loyal and motivated by our positions, the perks that the company gave us, and we played to win. I wanted to be the best geologist in my company. Even though this person was my friend, I wanted to be better. And he wanted to be better than me. That didn't mean we weren't friends. We were just always internally competitive. Now, the smallest group, the Gen Xers, which came after me, they came of age in the 1980s with MTV, Sesame Street, and computers. And it was funny with Victor Ramirez, because I showed him this. He goes, oh, yes, that's how I learned English, on Sesame Street. So, uh, so by, by Sesame Street time, I was already in high school. Um, they were independent and self-reliant. They distrusted in institutions in general. They were suspicious of people like me, of baby boomers, and our traits, because we had very different traits. Gen Xers were the first ones to say that work should be flexible. We should be able to work smarter, not longer hours. They didn't like working longer hours. They were the first group of individuals who were multitaskers because they came of age when there were computers. When I was young, you know, when I was young, there were no computers. When I was a teenager, Pong was, was a computer game. And their work, their work ethic was they cared little for titles. They weren't really loyal to their com Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I, okay. I had said nice things about you at the beginning, how I spent time with you and you had some work to do for me. Okay, I'm starting, I'm starting uh, my talk on, uh, on the workforce, and, and I'm a little ways in, and I don't want to go back because are we, uh, we're running short. We're running late, right? Um, you have until 345. Okay, yeah, I gotta, I'm gotta. i going to keep going. So all I'm doing is I'm introducing the different generations so that students can fill you in because they're, they're all writing notes feverishly right now. Um, okay, so, I'm, so I've gone through the older generation, my generation, and I'm talking about the generation called Generation X, which was grew up in the 1980s with Sesame Street. There were... There we go. There's a Sesame Street person. There's probably a few others in the room. <laughs> Their work ethic was they cared little for titles in general. You know, titles weren't that important for them. They weren't very loyal to the companies. They were quick to leave a company, although I did that, so I'm a little bit like this too. They were quick to leave a company for a different opportunity. And they wanted a casual workplace. They were the first generation to say, I don't want to wear a tie every day. I don't want to wear a jacket. And some companies in Canada used to have to wear a vest to work. And they said, oh, I'm a geologist, I'm not wearing a vest to work. So they were the first group to really push back on the old standards of that silent generation. So then we come to your generation. So you came to age, uh, came of age, came, meaning to understand you came in the 1990s and you grew up with technology. You don't really remember a time when there wasn't a computer. You don't remember a time when you couldn't watch a TV show again. 
because you always had the ability to do that. When I was young and the TV show came on, if it was Batman, you saw it once and then you didn't see it again. So if you missed it, you never got to see it. Your friends told you about it. So you couldn't Star Trek. You couldn't see it. Um, there are, you guys are ambitious, somewhat impatient, self-reliant, which is very good, and you're now the largest generation by population. You're interested in health, community, social issues are important to you, the environment is important, exercise and body adornment. Uh, so everybody knows what that means. Tattoos. Okay, none of my generation has tattoos. We went three generations with no tattoos and now it's very popular again. The work ethic is you, like, you, the, you work for personal fulfillment. Personal fulfillment is more important to you than what's best for the company. You're open with your communication. If you don't like something, you're going to tell somebody about it, which is good. You want positive support from the organizations. So unlike in my day, when I would never, I would never ask for support or ask for encouragement, if I was told I did a good job, I'd be happy. If I was told nothing, I would be happy. If I was told I did a bad job, I would be unhappy. We didn't expect to get feedback because the silent generation never gave feedback. They didn't say, great job today, John. You're doing great. They just didn't do that. So a little bit about how you work. Very much multitaskers, 24-7. You don't perceive necessarily a lack of work focus as impacting your job. So let me give you the example. You may work long hours, but not all of those hours are productive. You might be on your computer, you might be on your phone, you might be texting somebody, you might go to coffee. When I started 35 years ago, there were no coffee shops. People didn't go for coffee. We stayed in the building the whole day, and we worked, and then we went home. Today, the lifestyle is very different. You're all connected. You've all got busy things to do other than just being at work. It's a very different lifestyle than we had. You look for jobs that have personal fulfillment, that affirm, that's the importance. I'll, I'll, I'll give these guys, these slides to you guys if you want. You don't have to take pictures of them. Affirm, affirm the importance of the role that you have, and you have very high expectations of advancement. You expect to be able to learn a job in a very short period of time, and then move to the next opportunity very quickly. In my generation, you moved when the boss said you could move. You didn't necessarily move because you thought you knew the job inside out. Sometimes you stay two, three, four years in the same job because the boss wanted you there because you were the right person to do the job, even though you knew how to do it already. Okay, so that's just a little bit about what you'll face when you come into the workforce. You'll meet people that are baby boomers and Gen Xers who have a very different philosophy of life because of the way they grew up and, and became mature in, in the world. So let's talk about your career. And one of the most important things that we have as geoscientists is that we're considered in many countries professionals. So we, how would you define a professional? A professional is someone whose job can have consequences to the public through our work or through stock markets. So as geologists and geophysicists, if we make a mistake on a well, and I as a geologist looked at all the offsetting wells and I missed the fact that two of those wells had sour gas, and I told the drilling engineers that this, this had, there was no potential sour gas here, and we didn't set the rig up for sour gas, and all of a sudden we had a blowout and a sour gas and we killed 10 people. The ultimate responsibility for that works back to the geologist more than the engineer. Same with the public markets. What do I mean by that? Well, in stock markets, people buy companies because of the number of reserves they have. If we as geologists work with engineers and we make mistakes, people can lose millions of dollars. So we're, we can affect the public. Therefore, many countries make us be licensed. So just like doctors, lawyers, and engineers, we can be licensed. And in my country, I can lose my right to practice if I make a mistake. I can't call myself a geologist, and I can't practice the profession. So I have, I'm held to a very high standard by the regulator that if I do something wrong, I will lose my license to practice. And I will lose my livelihood. And I have to become a professional speaker. Okay? So, so professional behavior is essential in our roles for the public to trust us. And each one of you has to know that you have to build that professional status. Just because you get a degree doesn't mean you have a professional status. So this is, um, this is an interesting chart that Steve Sonberg put together. And I'd like to use it because it 
talks about all aspects of professionalism. So let's just get started on it. So integrity. You have to have integrity. It's it's clear as a professional. You have to you have to be able to have integrity and affirm the values of a professional. Competence. You have to continue to train. You have to be educated for the position. And if you move to something new, you have to be trained in that too. We're always learning. We have to be competent to be able to do those jobs. Honesty. We have to be honest and fair and straightforward in our business relationships and our relationships with other geoscientists. Ethical, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more and explain that a little more in detail. But we have to be known as people who know right from wrong because we're professionals and good from bad. From bad. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that after a couple slides. Oh, sorry. Attitude. We have to be committed in our jobs because they pay us a lot of money to do our jobs. We have to be committed to doing the work to achieve and maintain the confidence of the company and the public. Trustworthiness. We have to be confident and dependable, and we have to avoid conflicts of interest, places where it might be a gray area. We have to step back from those and say, no, I can't do that because I have a conflict of interest. I have a friend who's doing that, and I can't be involved. We have to be responsible to answer for our own conduct. We can't say, well, I didn't know. Well, how would I know? Well, that's our job. Our job is to know. I'm sorry, I'll move around on you. I'll try to stay more for this. Loyal. Oh, sorry. You have to be loyalty in terms of being faithful to a course, knowing that you're, you're going the right way and that you have the allegiance to do so. We have to have initiative, right? So we have to have the energy and the aptitude to display in taking action. So we have the initiative to do that in a professional manner. Candor, and that's a hard English word. It means being frank and, and, and free about without prejudice, meaning that we're going to talk, we're going to tell it like it is. We're going to tell them how we really feel. We're going to be very can candid on that. We need confidence to do our jobs. We need to believe in ourselves. Not over-believe in ourselves, but we need to believe in ourselves in the quality of the work we can do. We need to always be growing. So we need to constantly be maintaining and managing our skills. We need to be diligent when we do our work. We need to do hard work, we need to make sure it's right because we affect the public. We need to be respectful always as professionals. Have an attitude, like many of you have shown today, I liked this morning with the, with the students how, how they were, thank you for the talk, you did an excellent job. The, all of the positive feedback that I was hearing today was very professional and I was very impressed with that this morning. And finally, enthusiasm. When you're a geologist or a geophysicist in a company, you do a lot of work that's your own personal work, and your projects become almost your children. So if you're an explorer or you're developing a field, you really, you really become part of that, and it's exciting to you. And what you need to do is show that excitement and, and enjoyment of working on an asset that you're helping to bring that oil out of the ground or find that reserve. And through time, all these aspects of professionalism, you get better at when you're young, it's harder. As you get longer into your career, it becomes much more important to you. Now let's talk a little bit about ethics. So ethics is a is a complex a complex situation because different different countries and different parts of the world perceive ethics differently. So it's really the discipline of dealing with what is right and what is wrong. It's also good behavior. It's doing the right things, uh, and it's doing the proper thing every time. So this is a quote from a famous American president. When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. So he clearly could define in black and white at that time what was good and what was bad. It's not always black and white. So what, what, what else is it? It's high moral principles. It's a desire for a good reputation. In our industry, because, because there are 10 or 20 times the number of engineers there are that you assign this. It is a very small world. You think we're 40,000 members in APG, and SEG alone is close to 160,000 members, right? Now, some of them are geologists, but not many. Um, so there are many more engineers. But geologists know each other pretty well. And if, 
if you damage your reputation through your career, you do something wrong, or you, or you, you're ethically un, uh, you do something unethical, people will know, and people won't work with you anymore, and they won't trust you. You can never get this back if you mess up your reputation. Um, you fear of sanctions or being rejected. I mean, again, you can be. If you're in a professional body like mine, I can lose my license for doing something unethical. Um, the demands of society want us to be ethical in our profession. The same with the social license discussion I had yesterday. We have to be very professional to obtain that discussion with First Nations or, or Aboriginal communities. And it's much of this ethics is a requirement of professional affiliation. So you don't necessarily have to break the law to lose your license if you're unethical. Remember, you could be unethical and you could still could be legal, right? But ethics is, so ethical behavior is very important. So this is another way, you know, do what is right before you receive a summons before the law comes to you. If you don't do what's right, sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. Now, there's, this is another nuance, but between ethics and compliance. So compliance is doing what you're legally required to do. Law says I have to do this or I have to do X, Y, or Z. But ethical is sometimes doing what you're morally obligated to do for the good of the society and social license. So an example of that was, if you remember my talk last night, I didn't have to drill the three groundwater wells. There was no requirement to drill them. But ethically, to work in that social license with that community, we spent the money to drill the wells because it was the right thing to do, even though it wasn't legally necessary for us to do it. So aspects of ethics, the ability to discern right from wrong, good from evil, and propriety from impropriety, and a commitment to do what is right regardless of temptation, monetary gain, or pressure from somebody else. It doesn't matter if somebody's offering you a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, or a million dollars. If you're taking money to do a favor for somebody, that still is ethically wrong. We have to, as professionals, we have to always act ethically. So, just a couple more things. So, what is it? It's vitreous, it's honorable, it's moral, decent, equitable, just, and in general, it just feels like the right thing to do. If it doesn't feel right, then you should be asking your friends if you're doing the right thing. Uh-oh. Next, next, next one. Okay. Uh, the last quote, it's, a, it's an interesting quote because it's, the English is, I hope you can translate this. Ethical behavior is doing the right thing when no one else is watching, even when doing the wrong thing is legal. Now, it's an interesting term, right? So you could be ethically kind of, maybe I won't do it. Well, and even if I don't do it that way, I'm still not breaking the law, so it's still okay. No, that's not how ethics is done. We need to always be above that. Never be close to that line or be in a gray zone. Okay. So now, volunteerism, just a couple of words. The networks that you make as a volunteer, and in my view, and many people that I work with, they become your, your, they become your friends for your entire life. And, and uh, you know, we've talked about this a little bit today. Employees, colleagues, friends, families. But your volunteer network is the most valuable network you'll ever have in your life because you work together without remuneration, without being paid. You, become, you, you take early leader, leadership positions, you learn about business. In fact, I was teaching the YPs about APGs of business today. Um, you're working with diverse groups of geos, geologists, and geophysicists. Many of them may be older than you, and you're working with them. It's a great way to get trained in life. And it becomes the first time you actually get to manage other people, other than your parents, who you've managed for four or five years, uh, from 17 to 21. And then sometimes it doesn't work real well. My, my manager's me there's three and seven. They manage you already? Yes. Yeah, that's because you're an American. <laughs> that was a joke. I, I like that. That was just a joke. A Canadian, a Canadian to an American. It was just a joke. <laughs> we're, we're all Americans talking. No, we'll have a Canadian. <laughs> There's 300. And, no, I would be here. Um, so, a little bit about your career. I got a couple more slides. So, you are professionals. I hope that I've shown you that you're professionals. Be proud of that. You have to be, as Victor said, the same thing, a lifelong learner. I'm always learning something new. And you have to learn from the good and bad experiences. So if I do something at work and I 
really went sideways a little bit, and, and it, upon reflection, I went, yeah, I could have done that better. Make sure you don't spend time just celebrating the things you do really well and say, this is how good I am. But when it doesn't go right, and maybe it goes a little bit sideways, make sure you think about that. And how, how the next time I get to a situation like that, I might do it differently. Maybe it's how you worked with a colleague, or maybe it's how you worked with an engineer. Uh, something that didn't go right, try the next time to say, last time I did it this way, I'm going to try something different. It's really important in our careers to know that when we do something bad, that we're learning from it. And know where you want to take your career. I know it's hard when you're this young, but you know, if you want to be a manager or a technical person, right now you just say, I'll be anything. But, but when you get into jobs, for the first 10 years, I didn't want to be a manager. I had no interest in managing people because I liked doing geology. So I, they'd always ask me, would you say, no, no, I won't do I just want to do, I just want to be a geologist. I just want to do exploration. But finally, I did decide to change my role because I thought I could bring value in a different way. Roles are different, so you need to decide them, right? The company's going to help you, but you need to be directing the company, too. Plan your career in five years. We sit down quietly with a glass of wine and say, where would I like to, what would I like to do in five years? And in fact, when I interview people, students, or even when I interview people for new jobs, one of the questions I always ask them is, well, what do you want to be in five years? And you know what? Most of them have no idea. No idea what they want to do in five years. <coughs> they say, well, how would I know? I don't even have a job. I said, no, no, you don't need to have a job. What would you like to be doing? And one guy said, I want to be a president of a company. I said, hey, great. Like, you know that, you know, maybe you'll get there five years, but if that is actually what you want to do in your life, then plan your career accordingly. Don't become a petrophysicist, right? If that's really what you want to be, <coughs> treat your, so always be thinking, what would I like to do? No, and it always changes. Past change, things change. But try to have a goal for that five years. Oh, sorry. Learn as, I think I said a little bit about this, learn as much about the related disciplines, and Victor said the same thing. As geologists, the more we understand how land works, how joint ventures and contracts work, how HSNE works, how drilling and completions of production works, how all of that works, the more we broaden our horizons, the better we are at relating to those professions and being able to work more closely with them, what, rather than just saying, oh, you drillers just don't understand, or you production guys, you, you drill the road, you know, you don't have a road. So the more we learn about them, we can talk better to them. And finally, every day of your career, you make choices, spend some time being introspective introspective, thinking inside and saying, you know, what did I do well? What didn't I do so well? And how could I do it better than other day? Don't always choose the easy path. So this is one thing that's, that's hard for most people and very hard for me too. So there are things, skill sets that are not, I, I'm not good at. I'm not a very good carbonate sediment biologist <coughs> because I don't really like carbonates. I'm a plastics person. But I've taken jobs in my career that forced me to work on carbonate so I would become a better carbonate person. I'm still not an expert. I still think they're boring compared to plastics. But I'm still trying to learn more because it's a weak skill set for me. And ask for projects also that might make you feel uncomfortable. Not, not a little bit scared, a little bit uncomfortable, because it'll force you to learn new skills. And when you learn new skills, you're broadening your horizon. If you stay in the same skill sets you always have, you won't broaden out and be a well-rounded geoscientist or manager. So in summary, career spans, your career will span three or four decades, and trust me, it goes by very fast. I know you're sitting here, you know, like it goes by fast. So I'm 35 years into a career, and I feel like I just started yesterday. Multiple roles through your career, enjoy all of them, because they'll all be fun. We're professionals, our actions can affect the public, and as always, be ethical. You can destroy your career with one unethical decision. And challenge yourself to be better. Learn from good and bad experiences, because you are the future of the industry. So this is a lake that is about 160 kilometers west of Calgary uh, in the mountains, and uh, one of the more beautiful spots that we have. I'll leave you with that. I thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer a few questions.